3D Sonic games. Are they a necessity for gracious living? If we have learned anything in the past 25 years, the answer to this question is undoubtedly no. The character, once the king of the 16-bit era, helping to define an entire generation of video games, has arguably failed to deliver an authentic classic within polygons. Now, with over a dozen 3D Sonic games since Sonic Adventure, fans would hold out false hope that the newly released Sonic Frontiers would finally be capable of bringing Sonic back to gaming prestige. Still, as is standard for the franchise, critics would, at best, primarily refer to it as having moments that made the future of the series look promising, with glimpses of genius highlighting elements that could be good. Now an entire quarter of a century into the 3D Sonic paradigm, when is enough going to be enough? Where we all admit to ourselves that despite featuring promising moments, the 3D Sonic series will never be good. Franchises like Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda have been consistently excellent since jumping to 3D. In contrast, Sonic, for the most part, has been consistently average, to some cases downright awful. This raises the question, why do people still have faith in worshipping this blue RNA seed? And why do fans get hyped every time a new game featuring him is announced? In the words of George W. Bush... Fool me once. Shame on... Shame on you. It fooled me, we can't get fooled again. Let's take a look at the primarily disastrous last 25 years for the franchise and the many missteps Sonic has taken. So with that said, I am Lady Decade and this is Sonic Adventure 2 Sonic Frontiers, a series that is mostly bad. From experience making videos in the past, I have become familiar with the fact that for some reason. Appreciators of Sonic the Hedgehog can become very touchy very quickly when it comes to any criticism lobbied at their favourite blue cartoon animal. I have been battered in the comments section in the past for innocently poking fun at Shadow the Hedgehog and playfully pretending that I don't know what Rogue the Bat's name is. It seems there is a demographic out there who treat these children's characters extremely seriously and run to these fictional entities' defence if anything is said about them that they may deem mean. If you are one of these people, don't say that I didn't warn you and don't come at me in the comment section because I have warned you. I have. There you go. Basically, this video may not be for you because I am appalled at the direction the Sonic series has been dragged in over the last few decades. But all jokes aside, one thing certainly cannot be denied. That is the fact that Sonic's character design is so damn good that no matter how terrible the games get, he will continue to find an audience in gaming simply because the concept of Sonic himself is so bloody appealing. Sonic was designed from the start to print money, according to Google Trends at least. And that does not seem likely to change anytime soon. So if there is one thing I am sure most of us can agree on, the Sonic branding is on point. There was no better example of this than in the early 90s, when the Sonic series of games helped Sega become more popular than Nintendo. With Sonic the Hedgehog being pre-packaged with the Mega Drive, many kids opted to choose Sega's hardware and back Edgy the Hedgy over Nintendo's middle-aged fat Italian plumber. As they say over in America, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. What was great about this period is it wasn't just the character who was excellent. The games with their speed were equally as great too, resulting in a series of top tier 2D side scrollers that were the envy of Super Nintendo owners everywhere. Sega had positioned Sonic as the character that all the cool kids liked. He was rebellious, had attitude, and was essentially the video game equivalent to Bart Simpson, who was also hugely popular then. Radical dudes who were too cool for school. Who needs homework when you have Sonic the Hedgehog? 
But as with anything trendy, few things last forever. Mascot-based 2D side-scrolling platformers were quickly becoming oversaturated and looking like a relic of the past, which meant for the brand's long-term survival, a jump to the realm of 3D gaming would be required to stay relevant. Sonic's arch-rival Mario gracefully achieved this in 1996 with the excellent Super Mario 64, a game with its nifty dynamic camera that allowed Mario to search out power stars within a 3D exploratory environment. So now that Mario had made the transition, what about Edgy the Hedgy? Well, for a good few years, attempts at a 3D Sonic game were being made, with ideas first being conceptualised for a Mega Drive game, then later a 32X game, and then one on the Sega Saturn. This would essentially serve as one long, crazy, bodged development process for the game Sonic Extreme, with the title never seeing the light of day. Eventually, Extreme was axed as a result of getting stuck in development hell. Check out my video later on the Lost Sonic the Hedgehog trilogy if you want to learn more about this story. Instead, Sega would put out a rather average title known as Sonic 3D, which is not truly 3D as it's played using pre-rendered 3D models converted into sprites from an isometric perspective. So, no need to dwell on this one. It would not be until December 1998 that gamers would finally get their first 3D polygonal Sonic platforming game, which would come in the form of Sonic Adventure. To be fair to this game, at launch it looked phenomenal. The ultra powerful Dreamcast brought graphics in the home to a level that the public had never seen before. Sonic Adventure was a vast undertaking directed by Takashi Izuka and produced by Yuji Naka. It was one of the most giant games ever created, with a development team of over 100 staff members. Sega meant business with this one. Developed in conjunction with the Dreamcast itself, the Sonic team felt challenged to recreate Sonic and his world in a new way, feeling that the old character designs looked dated. Naka would make the characters, in his own words, look new, edgy, urban and more western, opting to attempt to choose to create a new version of the Sonic character which he felt looked more mature. An early decision was also made to make Sonic more story focused going forward and include several playable characters offering up completely different playstyles beyond the speed that Sonic himself was synonymous with. So instantly, as you can see, say you were planning something that long-term Sonic fans were not accustomed to. The biggest obstacle was transitioning from 2D to 3D, with some levels having to be rebuilt dozens of times. Sonic also had to be able to target enemies in mid-air, as jumping on them like in a 2D environment was too challenging in this fast-paced 3D world. A hub world would also be introduced to draw players deeper into the world, with the team opting to include as much varied content as possible in the game. With its brilliant graphics, Sonic Adventure would hit the market with a bang, wowing players with its style, but was it as solid as the 2D era games? Removing our nostalgia goggles, this game hardly offered the playability of platforming games such as Super Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie. The Sonic team was trying to pull adventure in so many different directions simultaneously that it felt like a jack of all trades, master of none. The best part of the gameplay is playing as Sonic the Hedgehog, running through stages at extreme speed and collecting rings along the way. While this can sometimes feel exhilarating, you never really feel in control as you run at such a speed that you easily die, as there is zero time to react when you reach an unknown obstacle. Furthermore, at times it doesn't feel like you are playing a game and feels more like watching a movie, as the camera is always doing weird things, like panning around in front of Sonic to try and make him look as cool as possible. Somehow, publications at the time were extremely forgiving of this title, even though they documented that the camera angles are frustrating and inconsistent, often going behind objects, and collision detection can be poor. The game is horrendously buggy, with players falling through flaws and getting stuck in places. These were all written off as minor flaws at the time, but I guess the graphics were good enough to woo the public. Away from Sonic the Hedgehog, playing as the other characters were not as fun either, and don't even get me started on Gamma 
and Big the Cat. The direction of this game felt confusing at best. Which I guess is the best way to summarise 3D Sonic as a whole. Three years later in 2001, Sonic Team would be back with Sonic Adventure 2, a game that was designed to be more action orientated than its slower, more story based predecessor. Its levels were created to facilitate this flow, making Sonic seem faster. All six playable characters have roughly equal gameplay time, unlike Adventure where some characters had short stories. This would be the game that introduced Shadow the Hedgehog and Rogue the Bat, two characters on which the fanbase to this day is somewhat split. The younger generation tends to like these, whereas those who were gaming in the 16-bit era felt the Sonic universe was getting a little crowded, and these newer designs looked a bit like Sonic Team were trying too hard to make characters that looked cool. Look at these. It's a dominatrix bat with giant boobs, and Sonic the Hedgehog only darker and more emo. The only thing that could have smelled of more desperation with his design would have been sticking a cigarette in his mouth. Shadow is a try-hard. I prefer simple Sonic. Joking about these two new characters aside, Sonic Adventure 2 certainly had gameplay elements that felt like a step up from the first game, with the fast-paced Sonic and Shadow stages being the high point of the title. But again, camera angles could be terrible. Playing as any of the other characters who emphasised completely different styles of play was pretty dull, and journalists at the time would deride the game's plot for being pretty rubbish. 3D Sonic games seemed to be okay, but there was a lot of room for improvement with them not delivering the quality of their more simplistic 16-bit predecessors. But from here, things only got worse. With the death of the Sega Dreamcast, the Sonic Adventure games would be ported to run on other modern hardware, such as the PS2 and Nintendo GameCube. Their re-emergence caused journalists to be much harsher towards them now that the initial magic of seeing Sonic in 3D had worn off. The first of these conversions, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, would get notably lower scores on non-Sega hardware and Sonic Adventure DX would be completely ripped apart. Critics were irritated that the game didn't fix all of the issues with the original. IGN went as far as to call the original version of Sonic Adventure undeserving of the high praise it received in the past. Opinions had soured on the adventure games very quickly. This brings us to 2003 and Sonic Heroes, the first 3D Sonic game in the post-Sega hardware era, with somehow Sonic games managing to get even worse. With Yuji Naka and Izuka at the helm once again, the pair had decided not to make a Sonic Adventure 3, as they felt the Sonic fandom was far too niche in comparison to previous years. Sonic no longer had the popularity he held over the Mega Drive era. Naka would look to the 16-bit era to recapture Sonic's glory, and create a game they felt more casual gamers could adapt to, so this entry would feature more linear action and platforming. Controlling four groups of three characters, each had its campaign and story. So, what would go wrong with this one? Many gamers and critics felt aggrieved that despite this now being the third 3D Sonic game, it still had all the same issues as its predecessors. Terrible camera angles, hit or miss lock-on attacks, stupid deaths out of the player's control, and poor collision detection. All ingredients are a recipe for disaster with platforming games which tend to flourish on feeling in control. Once again, players and publications would mock the needlessly convoluted story, which put far too much focus on all of Sonic's stupid friends, rather than the Blue Hedgehog, whom long-term fans were desperate to spend time playing as. This change of direction for the series also seemed to bring new fans. Five years into this 3D era for Sonic, more and more long-term fans of the series were becoming sick and tired of the strange story-focused direction things were going in and the lack of focus in trying to improve gameplay. There were now Sonic fans who had never even played the 16-bit games that had made the franchise popular in the first place. Sonic's weird furry friends had resulted in a strange movement online, 
whereby players would create Sonic OCs. OC meaning original characters. Cringe-inducing, poorly drawn fan art whereby fans of the series would create characters of their own, in many cases representing themselves in anthropomorphic form. And yeah, I am gonna laugh at this. I don't care, I didn't do it. This new breed of Sonic fans was undoubtedly not the same audience as the Bart Simpson, rebellious, radical dude appreciating one from years before. Sonic fans were getting weirder, much like the games themselves. By 2005, in a move that pissed off long-term fans of the series even more, they made a Shadow the Hedgehog game. A video game revolving around the cringy character they had been laughing at four years earlier. In a hilarious twist to make him even edgier, Yuji Naka and Izuka even decided to give him a gun. But what in the bloody hell was happening to the Sonic series? Ugh. Unsurprisingly, this gun-loving game was developed in the good old US of A at the now defunct Sega Studios US. Amusingly, Shadow was not implemented as the star of this game to attract a younger audience, but an older one. Even though Shadow may possibly be the most juvenile idea for a Sonic character that has ever been conceived. Shadow the Hedgehog introduces third-person shooter elements and non-linear gameplay to the Sonic franchise, but was this something that could actually add positively to the experience? Well, no. The game was horrendous. Game Informer said it best when they wrote, Not only is this new adult interpretation of Sonic painfully dumb, it's also ill-advised and almost feels like a betrayal to long-time fans. Official Xbox magazine reassured readers, Don't worry, Shadow the Hedgehog isn't half as urban or quite as gangster as it first seems. The laughable plot makes no sense and that various Sonic conventions undermined his attempts to be mature or edgy. It wasn't just the theme that was terrible, but the gameplay with various issues of Sonic's 3D past resurfacing, with still little in the way of improvements. Other complaints focused on the mechanics of weapons and vehicles, with the guns being nearly useless because of a lack of target lock or manual aim. Combined with poor level designs, Shadow the Hedgehog was a car crash. But somehow, things only kept getting worse. This brings us to Sonic 06, a game with one of the most infamous reputations of all time. Pre-release, the game looked promising at stages, but what would emerge on release day would disappoint even the most die-hard Sonic fans. During the game's development, Yuji Naka left Sega to form his own company, leaving this steaming pile of crap behind in his absence. The game would be criticised for its poor camera angles, controls, glitches, load times and level design. Issues that plagued previous games only seemed to worsen by the year. Again, as usual, not enough focus was placed on getting to play Sonic the Hedgehog, with the story being even more cringe-inducing in this offering than what we had in the past. Firstly, they included Silver the Hedgehog, with the game's creators miraculously creating a character less appealing than Shadow. But more hilariously, or, or disturbingly, it depends on how you look at it, Sonic was given a human girlfriend. Bestiality. Let that sink in. The plot involved bestiality. Any essence of Sonic games being considered cool was slowly slipping away, with these titles becoming more and more bizarre as the years went by. GameSpot would describe the game as a mess from top to bottom. Sonic's fall from grace was getting ridiculous now. A few months later, moving to February 2007, would see the release of Sonic and the Secret Rings for the Nintendo Wii. Could things get any more awful with the franchise already at rock bottom? Well, not in this case. The Secret Rings was still pretty lacklustre, but it wasn't 06 levels of bad. 
Like many Wii titles, the game was developed to be controlled with the Wii mode and takes place in an Arabian Nights style setting. Developed by a different team but at the same time as 06, it features a Prince of Persia like world with gameplay focused on Sonic as long term fans had craved for a while. Still, all the familiar issues continue to haunt the series from poor controls, camera movements, blind spots, and leaps of faith being a part of the play. Even though this game was a step up, it was not a step up that was significant enough to make it particularly good, which is a shame. Moving into 2008, with seemingly now average to bad yearly 3D Sonic releases, we got Sonic Unleashed. With it seeming like developers had run out of ideas to improve Sonic, things were getting stranger and stranger, with this entry allowing Sonic to turn into a werehog, an altered beast-like transformation that was pushing Sonic further and further from the source material. The werehog element was apparently to attract new fans to the series, which made sense given its diminishing popularity. Interestingly, at one point in its development, the game was intended to be Sonic Adventure 3. After introducing the Werehog innovation, this idea was dropped. A generally adverse reaction would be given by critics to the game, with many calling it a crap god of war. The Werehog sections are full of awkward action sequences, featuring what many describe as lethargic and heavy combat, with frustrating platforming elements only adding to the torture. But not all was terrible about this one. Rather annoyingly, the regular Sonic sections played quite smoothly, partly due to the transitions between 2D and 3D. After all, 2D Sonic has offered a lot more quality to gaming over the years. 2009 would introduce Sonic and the Black Knight to the world, a Wii exclusive where Sonic gets a sword. If Shadow with a gun didn't work, Maybe Sonic with a blade would do? Uh, nope. Obviously, this was another cringe inducingly bad Sonic idea. Set in the world of King Arthur, players can use a Wii mode to make Sonic fight using a sword, presenting why this madness exists. IGN would criticise this one, calling it broken and citing the controls were unresponsive. The game would also be criticised for its repetitiveness and limited controls. Sega decided to delist most of their modern Sonic games due to their poor reception. To give you an idea of how terrible things had become. Interestingly, there was a method to this strategy, as in 2010 Sega would finally put out some good Sonic content. These included the positively reviewed 2D side-scroller Sonic the Hedgehog and, more importantly, arguably the best 3D Sonic game, Sonic Colours. I know I said in this video that 3D Sonic games are always bad. Hypocrite warning. Well, this one may be a genuine exception to the rule. So, how was this achieved, you may ask? Well, the only playable character is Sonic, so we have no stupid friends, werehogs, guns or swords. So that gets an instant thumbs up from me. Probably looking to the success of Mario Galaxy, Colours is set in outer space and features gameplay similar to that found in the regular sections of Sonic Unleashed. The main new mechanic in Colours is the Wisp power-ups, which function similarly to those found in Mario games. According to producer Takashi Izuka, Sonic Colours was designed to appeal to a casual audience, particularly children and fans of the Super Mario series, which appears to have been a sensible move. No crazy storyline and no dumb characters. This was close to Sonic of old. So it's not surprising that it would be the most positively received Sonic game in years. Game Informer praised the Wisps for adding an interesting new gameplay mechanic without succumbing to werehog -itis. Still, despite being better than most, it has many age-old problems that had plagued the 3D games since Sonic Adventure, preventing this game from ascending past the high 70s on Metacritic. Not perfect, but some positive changes were coming for the series, so what next? 2011 brought along with it Sonic Generations, which I like, but 
we can't fully classify this as a 3D Sonic game, as all the best bits of it are experienced via 2D side-scrolling. In this quirky game where classic Sonic meets a newer Sonic, the gameplay offers a great franchise to its more celebrated past. Producer Takashi Izuka wanted a game incorporating the best of Sonic's history, offering more replay value than previous games. Eventually, the team decided to split the gameplay into two playstyles, one representing the original games and another representing more recent ones. This was another high point for Sonic within his rocky modern era. Although the game is better than most other Sonics, it's still been criticised for suffering from problems present in previous games, such as laggy controls and specific segments requiring split-second precision. Speed is not always Sonic's friend. Moving to the era of the Wii U, we got Sonic Lost World, a game that on the surface looks like Sonic's answer to Mario Galaxy, which is not a bad look at all. Levels range from side-scrolling 2D levels to fast-moving 3D linear levels to levels taking place on spherical worlds similar to the cancelled Sonic Extreme. Like in colours, the Wisps are back, offering a level of promise to the game. Sadly, the gameplay didn't deliver, with the game receiving mixed to average reviews. Strong criticism was directed at the game's control scheme, especially the new parkour mechanic. More irritatingly, Sonic Adventure issues persisted, including homing attacks being unreliable and the controls being problematic at times. Like is often with 3D Sonic games, the characters were mocked too, with the Deadly Six being negatively received. Down to their dreadful dialogue, EGM now observed the Deadly Six's presence, does subvert the worn-out Sonic vs Dr Eggman concept, I can't figure out if the plot is brilliantly self-aware parody, or whether it was scrawled together by a couple of grade schoolers on a Tokyo playground. Both options seem equally probable, frankly. But then we got another one of the worst moments in Sonic history. 2014 would see the release of Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric for Nintendo Wii U, a game that like Sonic Adventure before, would see the cast of Sonic the Hedgehog and Friends wholly redesigned. Apparently, the 1998 urban Sonic look no longer cut it. The Sonic Boom franchise was designed for a Western audience and served as a prequel to the television series. Sega of America's marketing director, Marcello Churchill, explained that the new franchise was not designed to replace modern Sonic, but create an updated version of the characters who are very different, both in tone and art direction. Amusingly, the Sonic fanbase who grew up with Sonic Adventure seemed far angrier about a change in art direction than the original fanbase ever were when everything changed from 2D to Adventure. One fan was so annoyed over Sonic's arm colour being changed to blue that they were attempted to go to GameStop and recolour the character's arms on the boxes back to a peachy colour. Tempers flared so much that the Sonic superfan even pepper sprayed a store employee. Sonic fans are radical sometimes. The Sonic Boom TV show would catch wind of this and create a character who looked like the attacker who would appear in the show to obsessively stalk Sonic and more hilariously repaint him with different colour arms. What an absolute mother the design should have been the least of player concerns, as the game was dismal, somehow proving even worse than Sonic 06. Rise of Lyric received negative reviews from critics for its controls, camera system, combat, story, gameplay, dialogue and numerous bugs and technical issues. Many deemed the game as one of the worst in the Sonic franchise. The game was a massive commercial failure, with the sales of Rise of Lyric causing Big Red Button, who had developed the game on behalf of Sega, to nearly shut down. Maybe Blue Armed Sonic was as big an issue as the creator of Sonic 2 had inferred all along. We would fortunately be blessed without a 3D Sonic game for three years after this point, with even the wonderful 2D throwback Sonic Mania to remind us how good Sonic should be in the first place. 
2017 would bring us Sonic Forces, a game with a selling point where you would create and play as your own Sonic OCs. Honestly, wow. Has it really come to this? So, what's next in Sonic games? Sonic Vore, anyone? In this one, players can play as classic Sonic or modern Sonic. And when I say modern Sonic, I mean the 1998 version, not the blue armed one that resulted in store employees being pepper sprayed. On top of this, you can also play as your OC, bringing your creepiest Sonic deviant art gaming creations into reality. The game delivers a mix of play, classic side-scrolling modern Sonic gameplay like in Colors and Unleashed. On the other hand, the OC is unique in that he can use weapons, which isn't a mechanic I ever wanted to see in a Sonic game again. Can't we? Just go fast. The game, like Shadow the Hedgehog, aimed to make the franchise darker. Another cringeworthy goal I don't see why they keep attempting to swing for. I mean, you play as a blue freaking hedgehog. It's hardly a Tim Burton movie. Amusingly, the fact you can play as OCs is a direct response to all the weird deviant art online. Sonic Team head Takashi Izuka explained that for years he had seen many fan-made characters and wanted to allow players to play as their own. Game Informer stated, 3D Sonic games still aren't to where they should be after such a long time of iteration and experimentation. The Escapist panned it for not exploring the potential of its ideas and lambasted the story for its attempt at a more mature tone. Sonic Forces remained faithful to the trend of 3D Sonic games. This finally brings us up to date and around to this week's release, Sonic Frontiers. As is usual with 3D Sonic games, despite a zero track record to suggest that we will ever get a top level 3D Sonic game, for some reason excitement for this game was super high. I guess that some of the gameplay trailers that have been shown off in the past have showed off that players might get something Sonic related akin to Breath of the Wild. So gamers put their hands together and prayed that finally 3D Sonic would be genuinely good. Once again, players were delivered a decidedly average game, with this 3D platformer plagued with all the same problems that 3D Sonic has always suffered from, never addressed since Sonic Adventure. I wonder if series producer Takashi Yazuka has anything to do with this. After all, he has been involved with 3D Sonic since the Dreamcast. The designers focus on transitioning Sonic's speed and abilities to an open world design, while remaining true to previous games, and my god have they remained faithful. Despite its vast shortcomings and average review scores, some have referred to it as the best Sonic game in years, highlighting that if the Frontiers formula is more refined down the line, then the future of 3D Sonic looks more promising. All I can say is that after failing to get 3D Sonic right after all these attempts, it is bloody fantastic to see how popular this series is, with the sales results paying testament to how brilliantly conceived the character of Sonic the Hedgehog is. The mechanics that keep 3D Sonic gameplay a bit rubbish don't seem to be going away. I guess brilliant or terrible, Sonic with his alluring shade of blue will continue to produce game sales, regardless of whether we will get something out of him on the level of Super Mario Odyssey, or it's being down there with Clay Fighter 63 and a third. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe and watch my recent upload on the Lost Sonic Trilogy. See you soon.